There's nothing like being like upstage by cake, is there? I'm, I'm not going to have anybody's attention here now. Uh, this morning, I want to speak on the subject of living generously. And you're going to have to be generous to me because I tried to keep this short. And the Bible is absolutely rammed, loaded, packed, stacked with generosity. So don't blame me. So this morning, I want to look at this value of generosity, which we actually hold really dear at Hope House. And I want to think about what being generous means in the context of the church. But first, obviously, because I'm me, I've got to tell you a Kingfisher story. <laughs> so in the follow-up to my Kingfisher adventures that I shared with you last time I spoke, where I had a stalker who kept barging me off the shot in a competitive photo attack, I uh, went out the other day and I had the most amazing session. And I'd, I'd already spotted one or two perches that the Kingfisher was hunting from. And then this, this bloke came up with a massive long lens and everything was in camouflage, including the camera and his bag and ev everything. And I thought, oh, this is going to ruin my session. And I smiled and said hello. And he went, hello. He said, I've heard these kingfishers. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, there are. He says, I've never got a kingfisher photo. And I thought, there's two ways to go here. I can go, oh, yeah, they're, they're around the back. <laughs> You'd not get kingfishers here, mate. They're round about. I could say, actually, mate, I was stood here ten minutes ago, and on that branch there, I got a really clear shot of a kingfisher. So that's the route I took. Just, I want credit for that one, thank you. <laughs> and actually, I got on really well with Derek. He was a lovely bloke. And the kingfishers were so active, it was really helpful that two of us were working in partnership because he spotted things I didn't, and I spotted things he didn't. And then when he got good shots, he came flying over like a kid, going, look at this, look at this. And I'm looking, and I'm going, look at this, Derek, look at this. And do you know what? I enjoy my day more because Derek got good shots. So it's easy to live your life thinking, I want the best shot. And I do. I always want a better shot. But actually, we're meant to enjoy each other's successes. You see, generosity isn't only about how much we give, it's about sharing our lives with other people. Generosity is a, is a really important part of living out the gospel. As Christians, we're meant to be good news people, which means that people ought to feel better after they've been with us than when they're not with us. See, I've met generous people inside and outside of the church family. And they're all people who, when I see them, I smile straight away. Because I know that being with them will make me feel better about myself and everything that's going on. And they'll build me up. Because they're good news people. So the first thing I want to explore this morning is, is what our motivation to live generously should be. So I'm going to start with a few very well-known verses which get read at nearly every wedding. But they're not just for dress-up Saturdays. They're fundamental verses for every day of our lives reading from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, um, boast but do not have love I gain nothing don't look away when you read and you lose your place <laughs> love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it is not proud it does not dishonor others it's not self-seeking it's not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth it always protects always trusts always hopes and always perseveres you see if we give Without love, we give nothing. I think that these verses sit at the heart of the kind of generosity that we call to live out in the church. See, whatever spiritual gifts we have within the church, whatever we achieve, whatever we give away, we must be motivated by love. There are a couple of points I want to think about around this subject. You see, the kind of love that we consider in here in this wedding passage the wedding passage to end all wedding passages, and don't worry, I did at my wedding as well, <laughs> is that 
the word love isn't romantic love. The word love is the word agape. And Thayer's def definition, sorry, I just thought I'd try and be a bit clever there. <laughs> so I read a Bible dictionary, and the definition of agape was brotherly love, affection, goodwill, love, and benevolence. So we need to experience agape love within the family of the church. But that's not just a warm and fluffy feeling. Because agape love also includes benevolence. Now the fancy word benevolence simply means to do good. The dictionary says its opposite is malevolence. Which means wishing or doing evil to others. So benevolence is a powerful word. Basically in these verses... In Corinthians, Paul the Apostle, who first appears in the New Testament persecuting Christians, is urging us towards love and good deeds. In the dictionary app I use, opposites are shown as a little circle, half of it's black and half of it's white. And I think that's a lovely picture of Paul, actually because in his malevolence, he persecuted the church. But after encountering Jesus... The circle switches. And he's a man of benevolence. A man who carries the gospel, who carries good news, who is good news. Yeah. See, how did all that come about, that change? It comes about because of the greatest love of all. The love that God demonstrated in sending Jesus to live amongst us, to give his life for us, and then to rise up and reign in heaven. So the change in Paul is because of the love that originates in God. And he's demonstrated to us through Jesus, our Lord. The love that transformed Paul is the love that transformed you. Yeah. Yeah. Same love. Yeah. John puts it like this in 1 John 3, verse 16 to 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. You see, the love which forms the foundation of generosity in the church family is the example that Jesus gave us in his generous life. In his life, in his death, in his resurrection. John reminds us that we cannot love simply with words or speech, but we have to love with actions. We have to give generously to those in need. There's something else I want to look at in our motivations to be generous, and I'm going to read from Luke this time. In Luke chapter 6, sorry, there's a lot of references, because like I said, when I started studying this subject, there's just loads of it. Read your Bible. If you want to know about generosity, ignore everything I say and go home and read your Bible. But do that later. For now, just bear with. <laughs> Luke 6, 37 38. We read, these are Jesus' own words. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. These are really interesting verses. Jesus links the themes of being judgmental, forgiveness and giving in these two verses. These things aren't obviously linked, but, you know, they are. They absolutely are linked. You see, Jesus is talking about the principle of how we treat others. And how we treat others rebounds onto us. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's difficult verses, really, because we love to focus on the unconditional love that, that we've received because of Jesus. But I actually don't think these, these verses contradict grace at all. I think they help us to enter into the fullness of the generous lives that we can lead because of God's grace. Yeah. This clearly needs explanation. I had to read it about eight times after I'd written it, and I'll probably have to re-explain it. You see, if we're not judgmental, if we forgive freely, if we give with open arms, we are simultaneously pouring out to others 
the blessings that God's pouring on us. You see, because we've escaped God's judgment through Jesus, we do not judge others. Because we've been forgiven, we're able to forgive others. Because we've received many gifts from God, we can give from the riches we have through grace. Do you see why I don't think these verses contradict free grace? Because actually I think they're in response to it. If we receive open-handedly from God, it's going to slip through our fingers and it should. If we're forgiven freely by God, that should slip through us to everybody around us. If we fear no judgment because Jesus paid the price for us, that grace should be in our attitude to everyone around us. Whether they've found Jesus yet or not. Because God pours into us so that it will pour out. He doesn't pour into us so we can be big fat vessels that don't leak. He lets us be leaky so that his blessings can reach out into our world. Now let's think about how we give, or rather what our attitude to giving should be. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly, it's cheery reading this today. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, under compulsion. For God lives a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. We should give cheerfully. I, I've always had a soft spot for these verses. I love the image of someone having a right good laugh as they give. You know, just real joy. The, the, McCoy, the bit where you actually show it on your face. Not deep, spiritual joy. I'm so joyful right now. I'm going to joyfully give everything I have right now because I'm very, very joyful. Very, very joyful. Joy, joy shows. Joy shows. Joy shows. Tina walked in the cafe on, was it Friday? And I was having a fairly rough session of like being quite busy. And as soon as I saw her, my face lit up with joy because I wasn't expecting her. And it was a joyful sight. Tina back for a while. Not for long enough, but for a while. <laughs> yeah, when we give, we also receive. Because the measure that we use when we give will determine the measure used when we receive. And actually, this is about attitude. Because if we're not open, giving, caring, generous people, we won't receive generosity. It's not that God doesn't give us it. It's just we don't put ourselves in the right position to receive it. Yeah. It's all there for us. God's riches. Yeah. But sometimes we don't see it because when we're not living generously, when we're living stingily, we don't see the good stuff God's got for us. Our eyes aren't open to it. Yeah. See, the other thing in this is God isn't the slot machine. It's not that we put a pound in and get at least a pound back, maybe 125 or 130, or if being super spiritual and very lucky, two quid. It doesn't work like that. Our financial investment in the kingdom of God pays dividends in ways we cannot imagine. Doing good, uh, doing good to others also does good to us. So when we give to God, it's not that we expect that money to come back to us. We give to God because we invest. And what we invest in God does more good than the sum of the money that we invested. In Matthew 6, verses 1 to 4, we read more of Jesus' words on, on giving. He says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. 
Giving's not a spectator sport. When we give to church, we cannot give in the hope of recognition. For one thing, at Hope, at Hope House Church, there is only one person who knows what any individual gives to church, and that's the treasurer. And he needs to know for practical reasons. The rest of the leadership do not know what any one individual gives. We just know what expenditure we've got, and we know what gifts we've received towards the expenses. What you give is between you and God. And Neil does an amazing job of never allowing that knowledge to influence how he treats people. We've been married a long time. He tells me nothing about that. And I am very grateful he doesn't, because I don't know sometimes how he can be as neutral as he manages us to be in that position. So we should give in secret. So when we give to church, we give not to be recognised and not to have a chair with our name on it or a plaque on the wall or a facade that is named after us. We give because we're giving into the kingdom, a living, breathing church. And when we give directly to someone in need, we shouldn't publicise that either. How bad would you feel if you were desperately in need and somebody went, do you know what, I've seen you in need, I've seen your shoes, they've got holes in. Here's some new shoes, but I want you to stand up here while I present it to you in front of everybody so they all know I gave you shoes. Do you know what, I'll, just, I'll have leaky shoes, I'm good for that, thank you. There's no dignity in that, is there? When we give to people, we should give it without any sense of reward or satisfaction. We should give to help someone or to make ourselves feel good. That's the problem, isn't it? When people give to, to make themselves feel good. You get a lot of this on the internet. You get on YouTube, you get on Facebook. You get a lot of people giving publicly to people who are in poverty. And sometimes these things are deeply set up and it's obvious. And sometimes I just think, could you not have just given that bloke a meal without filming it? Would that not have been slightly more humane? Enough said. Personal bugbear. God knows what we give, and he knows when we give, and he knows how we give, and that's all that matters. Can't give to make ourselves feel good. When we do, it's like Jesus said, we've already had our word, our reward, because that's the smug sense of self-satisfaction we feel because we, we did that. We should try and bless others when we're aware of the need, but we should do it quietly without judgment or conditions. Because ultimately, what we give, we know we've already received from God. This isn't us being big, this is God being generous. Yes. And if God chooses to be generous through you, that's how God is choosing to be generous. That's not, that's not you going, I can do this, I can fix this. That's you saying, Lord, I see a need. Help me help. And then being that help. See, another way we should give is sacrificially. And in Matthew 26, 6 to 13, we read about a very particular encounter. This one's a challenging one, I think, sometimes. Reading from Matthew. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume should have been sold at a high price. And the money given to the poor, so obviously they'd not just been like grabbing, they'd want to give it away. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Isn't that touching? See, I chose this example out of hundreds of examples of sacrificial giving in the Bible. Because once the woman had poured out the perfume, it couldn't be used again. It had been used. It wasn't going back in the bottle. It couldn't be sold. It no longer had any value. 
accept the value that Jesus says will be remembered wherever the gospel is preached. You see, this woman's gift is remembered, although we never know her name. And this is a prophetic act that points us towards the sacrifice that Jesus is going to be, going to be making on the cross. So when the disciples said the perfume, perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor, Jesus says that we'll always have the poor around. But we'll not always have him around in physical sense like that. See, this must have been hard teaching for the disciples because... Jesus had hinted enough by now, genuinely, but we don't listen to things like that, do we? So some of the disciples must have still been expecting some glorious triumph rather than Jesus' sacrifice. So this is hard teaching. But in a hard sense, it's teaching, hard teaching for us too because we tend to think that we somehow have, have to end poverty, but in truth we never will. Some days, volunteering in food bank is really, really heartbreaking because the system is currently failing a huge number of people. Zero hours contracts, rising fuel costs, rising prices are contributing to hard times for ordinary people and we can't fix these issues. Some people live chaotic lives and they don't want to change and we can't fix their lives. What we can do is treat people kindly and without judgment. And there are times when we can help, and there are times when we cannot. And there are some really important social initiatives springing up in our nation. Things I never thought I'd see 30 years ago. But community fridges, clothes banks, food banks, lots of community initiatives are springing up to address poverty. And there are a chance for us to get involved and work alongside people who are already working on this stuff. Look into what's going on. Look on social media, look online. Chat to Ruth about her new job. Wave, Ruth. It's a fantastic, fantastic scheme. You see, we need to find ways as a church to support local initiatives and get involved and volunteer if we have availability. Because as a church, we're partnering with and hosting lots of groups whose aim is to make ordinary people's lives better. See, as a church, we don't need to create 100 initiatives which already exist. We need to partner with existing organisations. Because we're in this world. We might be kingdom people, but we're kingdom people in this world. And to be honest with you, if you look at most organisations... Somewhere in there, you'll find Christians in the mix, volunteering and giving their time to help community. So I want to challenge you to have a little think about that. Have a think about how you might support some of these social initiatives. Right, the last area I want to explore is the one that you all thought I'd go for first. The area of what we should be generous with. Look to our motivation or our attitude. What? What to be generous with? Let's take the obvious one first. We should be generous with our money. In Luke 21, verses 1 to 4, we read, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. I love these verses. See, basically, it doesn't matter if you've got very little. If you contribute, your contribution is as great as anyone else's. If you can only afford a quid to someone else's 100 or 1,000, in God's sight, you give them more. And he can do so much more with your generosity. But if you can afford a 100, but you only give a quid, you're not giving out of poverty. You're giving without generosity. If the first thing you think about cutting when it's hard is what you give into the kingdom, you pick the wrong place to start. 
And these verses are just astonishing. I actually read them out to Paul when I was giving him the verses to write up. And if you've got plenty, Timothy writes in 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. When we give from plenty... We're taking hold of the life that is truly life. I love that phrase. That's brilliant, isn't it? That's like the 80s life in abundance that we all got excited about. But actually, if we give out of what God has given us, out of our plenty, we get to live a richer life than if we hoard. We absolutely do. Secondly, I'm not going to say a lot more on money, because if it were Neil, he'd have like, carried on by now. But actually, I just think we need to think about what we're spending our money on, and we need to think about what we invest in, because where we invest the most, that's where our heart is the most. I was in Wex, which is a photography shop at the top end of Leeds. <laughs> Yesterday, I suffered sore temptation. So, so temptation. But I can't afford the thing I want, so I just walked away. God's not asking us to give everything away. He's asking us to give what he gives us on. He's asking us to receive with open arms and let it flow out. And sometimes that's money, and sometimes that's things. So in Matthew 14, 14 to 21, you can read an account of the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus has been talking to quite a while for people and the people are getting hungry and the disciples have got to send them away so they can eat. And Jesus says, well, you give them something to eat. So I'm out of time, that's why I'm paraphrasing. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And he goes, but we haven't got all. And Jesus says, what have you got? So we've got five loaves and two fish. So we'll give it here then. So Jesus takes what they've got, the things that they have to give, and he blesses it and he divides it up. And everybody, 5,000 people and more, eat their fill. Yeah. And there's leftovers. And the leftovers outweigh the initial steak of five loaves and two fish. When we give Jesus what we have, not what we think he'll be impressed by, there are no limits to what Jesus can do with our small acts of generosity. Sometimes we don't give the small things because we think, that's ah, not big enough. Sometimes it's the small things Jesus wants. Sometimes it's the five loaves and two fish. And I tell you, if that's what Jesus wants, there's no end to what he can do with it. The third area where we need to be generous is with our time. We have a series of value statements at Hope House. And the first of these is generosity. I'm going to read that statement. Hope House Church values those who serve willingly and generously. Selfless, selfless servanthood and humility are hallmarks of our culture. Serving is our highest calling. We believe that. The church doesn't happen if people don't serve. There are loads of areas you can serve in. You can serve in... Kids work, they always need people, and that's great to get involved with, talk to one of the kids' workers. The hospitality team love it when someone else joins. There's youth, there's music and tech, building maintenance. Anything you think about cutting grass, there are so many things that need servants, and servants who do it just to serve, yeah. just to serve. cafe has got a lot of happening in it. If you don't know, ask. Or better yet, drop into the cafe between 9 and 2, Tuesday to Friday, and we'll show you. Because you might not have a lot of time to give, but we're now so busy that sometimes the best thing you can do for us is to come in, sit down, buy a coffee, because I always pay our wages, and um, talk to my customers. Because I don't have time to do that anymore. We're too busy. I'm missing the opportunity to connect to people. 
Sue, Sue Ant sat down, a right good cow with any of her ages, but genuinely busy. So if you're interested in what's happening, come and see. And, and we'll show you what groups are going on. You'll see what influence you are having today without realising it in resourcing groups that are helping the wider community in ways we couldn't imagine. And, and really, it really is mind-blowing. And the last thing I've got to say has been challenging me all week because I know I have to do better at this. I know I have to do better. We need to be generous with our words. We need to be generous with our praise, with our encouragement, with reassurance, with affirmation. We can build other people up. Do you know that hard words don't grow people? Loving words do. So... Knowing going into this, I was going to be over, over time by now. Can I have the music team back, please? I'm going to read one final piece of scripture which sums up, for me, everything I've said this morning. And this piece of scripture I have loved since I met the Lord. I once read it out to a youth group in the hope we wouldn't bicker over the rules of uh, rounders. <coughs> Didn't work. Therefore, from Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not look into your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Jesus is our example. His generosity knows no bounds. I'm just going to pray for us this week. Lord, we pray that this week we might be a generous people that your goodness as it pours into us will pour out of us into every situation we find ourselves in Lord we pray that we might might grasp who you are to us and grasp who that means we can be wherever we are because you continually fill us so that we can be emptied Amen